Welcome to Discovering. Tonight's story is brought to us by Brian Whitens of 906 Outdoors. Brian takes an in-depth look at wildlife habitat here in the UP. Future for white-tailed deer in the Upper Peninsula is gonna depend on our ability to establish and maintain conifer shelter for those animals. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover when you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan. Habitat is defined as the place or environment where a plant or animal naturally or normally lives and grows. It's all around us. It's the trees, the water, and the soil. And here in the UP, well, we pretty much live right in it. It's part of our livelihood. The UP was built on mining and lives on the timber industry and tourism, all part of the habitat picture. Because of where we live, we are in one way or another very connected to the outdoors, to the habitat that surrounds us. Whether it's hunting, fishing, hiking, biking, camping, berry picking, or just a walk in the woods, we are affected by the state of the nature that we work and play in. And of course, so is the wide variety of wildlife that claim it as their own backyard. So, what is the state of our wildlife habitat today? What did it used to be? And where are we headed? For some insight into these questions, I sat down with wildlife biologist Jim Hamill, who has been involved in the management of wildlife habitat, I think maybe forever. Well, we live in a really special place here in the Upper Peninsula because about 97% of the land surface is covered by trees. And uh, those trees are important to us in a lot of different ways. And not only are they critical to us for the economy of the Upper Peninsula, but also the trees are attached to our culture. The culture of the UP is really forest uh, centered. I think our culture, our economy is dependent upon good forest management. One of the things uh, from the cultural standpoint that we, we know is important to so many of us up here are the wildlife resources. We have over 300 species of native wildlife species in, in this state and they're all dependent upon a specific habitat type. And here in the UP, we can provide for a lot of those different species depending upon how we manage the forest. You can't just treat it with a broad brush and say, okay, this, this forest or all forest is habitat. Uh, that's much too broad a brush. Uh, you can uh, manage a forest very specifically for species. Uh, for example, our aspen uh, forest types are wonderful and very productive for rough grouse and woodcock and black bears and uh, white-tailed deer and about 90 other species that are native to Michigan that we don't really think that much about. But uh, aspen is critically important. Our northern hardwoods, which are so important uh, both economically to the UP and unique to the Upper Peninsula, we're, we're still one of the largest intact northern hardwood uh, producing forest areas in the world here. And uh, the, the proper management of that forest type yields not only great uh, benefits e economically and culturally, uh, but it also uh, yields a, a tremendous amount to wildlife. Back in pre-settlement times, these northern hardwood forests were dominated by maple and yellow birch and hemlock, particularly. And over the years, uh, what's happened with our northern hardwood forests is that they become more and more similar throughout. 
what has happened then is that it reduces the amount of diversity in that stand. And when you reduce diversity in any habitat type or any forest area, you're reducing its ability to uh, serve a variety of wildlife. Uh, there are species that are dependent on certain age classes of uh, various forest types. Age classes of them and size classes of forest types. I, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, pileated woodpeckers cannot survive in forests that uh, don't have any trees that are over 16 inches in diameter. Uh, the reason is because they need that diameter a tree to nest in. White-tailed deer do very poorly in places that are devoid of aspen. Why? Well, it's not so much the aspen tree itself, but it's because of the forest floor and what grows on the forest floor that supports those deer. From the wildlife standpoint, the ideal situation is to make sure that those stands of northern hardwood have the, the same or even more species present than they had when the original pre-settlement forests were in existence. In other words, reintroduce hemlock, reintroduce white pine into those stands, and, and in some places even yellow birch. We need to keep as many different species in those stands as possible. That's the sort of the ecological end of things. The financial end of managing those stands that would that would be in my view perfect is to have stands with high quality saw timber and high quality pulpwood and enough regeneration to sustain that stand into the future that's a sort of a perfect scenario for northern hardwoods when you speak of wildlife in a broad sense which which you have to recognize is that they need three basic things they need shelter they need food and they need water. And some species of wildlife get their water from the food. For example, most of our game, game birds don't need free-flowing water. However, white-tailed deer do much better when there's free-flowing water available. Same with black bear. Uh, free-flowing water is important to them. So those are the three habitat components you have to understand to, uh, for every species to manage effectively for them. If you don't understand the habitat needs, the critical uh, requirements of rough grouse, it's going to be difficult for you to manage a forest stand for them. Uh, and the same thing is true of any species that you want to mention. They're all dependent on specific situations in the woods. One thing that I always look for is stand structure. Stands are areas of four, uh, uh, occupied by trees. That's a stand of trees. But if you look at a stand of trees, there's a lot more to it than just trees. There's the overstory, there's an understory, there's a ground cover. And the more complex you can make all three of those things, the better off you're going to be for uh, maintaining wildlife in that forest area. Working toward better wildlife habitat has been going on for years in the Upper Peninsula. I met with Jim for a story back in 2015 about some of the reasons habitat is so critical to our deer. This is primarily dominated by northern hardwoods, but there's, a, there's some clumps of hemlock in here, and you can see how deer are utilizing this hemlock area. The primary reason that deer utilize these areas is that they can get around a lot better, they can move more quickly, and they can access food resources where they're not fighting 16, 18, 20 inches of snow. And the reason that snow is, deep, is much less deep under here is that hemlock intercepts snow very well. You can see the uh, hemlock branches that have intercepted all this snow. And a lot of times over time that snow just evaporates and doesn't end up on the ground and uh, cause problems for deer to move. To have 70% overhead uh, cover intercepting snow is what we would classify as uh, functional shelter for white-tailed deer. And this is relatively young hemlock here. And let's take a look at what we got. Nine inches of snow here. So we just step out of the hemlock stand where there's no intercept of snow at all. And here we are, 17 inches of snow. And of course, no deer use. You know, 40 yards from us where we've got hemlocks, we've got deer use. And they're going to use that because they can move. It's not, I, I think it's not only a matter of them moving for food resources is easier in a place like that, but also 
if they're bedded and they're faced with a predator, a predator comes hunting through this area, uh, moving in eight or nine inches of snow and being able to quickly out, out maneuver a predator is much easier than you're, when you're dealing with 17 or 18 inches of snow uh, for a whitetail. Now I've heard people say that um, they don't believe we're losing conifer and uh, the truth is we, we probably are not losing conifer over the entire Upper Peninsula. The conifer uh, acreage is probably stable or even in some places increasing. Where we have lost conifer that is good shelter for deer is in those critical deer yards. In the Upper Peninsula, 100% of our deer have to live on only 10% of the landscape during difficult winter conditions. So they are concentrated. That these yards have, uh, that currently are in existence, mostly have been ex in existence for at least the last 50 or 60 years. So those places are absolutely critical to the welfare of whitetails. had the opportunity to visit a hardwood stand habitat project in action and talk with the various individuals involved from the planting stages to the cutting and finally planting. If you look at this project uh, right here, you'd, you'd be surprised that this is called Deer Winter Range, but it really is. You know, a lot of people think of deer yards as those places with heavy canopy of conifer like cedar and hemlock, which is true, but Deer Winter Range also includes a lot of food areas and areas that may not have as heavy a conifer component. And in this particular spot, what we have is a, is a hardwood stand that historically had a lot of hemlock and some cedar even in it. And through the decades and decades, the various landowners who've owned this property have systematically removed that softwood and all we have left here is pretty much a pure hardwood stand, uh, which gives some uh, decent uh, browse potential for deer and for example, for moose as well. But in order for deer to use this in the wintertime, we have to recreate a conifer situation within this hardwood stand. So <clears throat> what we're going to do in this stand is to reintroduce conifers. We're gonna reintroduce white pine, white spruce, and balsam fir into this stand. Having that conifer in the stand uh, intercepts snow and allows deer to move around to browse on what browse is available. It tremendously serve deer, but also serve about 80 other species that are native to Michigan that need that habitat. So whenever you diversify a stand, you're making it a better habitat generally for both game and non-game species. And in the UP Habitat Workgroup, this is what we're focusing on. And we're focusing on doing that kind of work in places that traditionally we, uh, we wouldn't have an opportunity to do that work in. Uh, because of the last license fee increase, that increase provided some money so that uh, grantees could use that grant money on private lands that were critical to uh, wildlife. And that's what we're doing here. Some folks would say, well, that, that's public money being used on private land. That's true. And, but the deer are on private land and they're on public land, so they move everywhere. It, it, we're serving a migratory deer herd that crosses commercial forest reserve land, crosses state land, and crosses private land also to end up here in the wintertime. So what we're doing is focusing on the resource that belongs to the people, not the resource that is privately held so much. My name's Hunter Peterson, and I'm a project manager for the Sustainable Resources Institute, which is a nonprofit in Crystal Falls. And we focus a lot on forestry issues. We also do different restoration projects. We do a lot of this through grant funding. So we, we find partners for uh, projects that we're interested in and worthy causes, and we try to put something together. We have done project work on over 20 landowners' properties, and it's a little over 200 acres of actual project acreage. So that's where the on the ground work is happening. They also connect to other valuable properties. If you're doing work on one property, it's gonna benefit a whole litany of other properties and acreage around the area. Safari Club International Foundation, under the lead of Jim Hamill, decided to apply for a Michigan Wildlife Habitat Grant. And it was directly to support 
work going into deer winter and complexes and enhance them across the UP. And really what our role is, is we're taking all these different elements and bringing them together. And we submit this to the DNR and they consider it, it's a competitive grant program. Not everybody who applies will get the funding. In these grant programs, they require the uh, grantee ourselves to put some money into these projects ourselves to show we're serious. And SCIF has been gracious enough to provide that. They have provided tens of thousands of dollars um, in support of these projects to make this happen. We are using SCIF foresters and um, habitat specialists like Jim and Stu, and they are putting together these plans. And this is not funded by the DNR. That planning work is completely funded by SCIF, and that's what makes these projects possible. We're fortunate on this uh, uh, harvest operation to have Shamco out of Iron River uh, as the active uh, contractor on the job. No one person can do it all together. It takes a team to make these things come together and we, we have a good situation going here. And Todd and Kurt from Shamco uh, are representatives of the company that's here. We are a logging contractor out of Iron River. We've been in business for uh, Shamco for 25 years. Our, our family's been in this logging business for uh, 50, 50 plus years. We enjoy working in the woods. Um, we've got a we've got a great conscientious crew that that does a good job. We do a, a ton of work on on uh, U.S. Forest Service land. Actually, we're probably the biggest uh, contractor on the Ottawa Ottawa National Forest, and we also cut a substantial amount for the for the state of Michigan too. I believe we have a very good rep. We're contacted a lot by independent foresters to to cut on on different properties, and we have a very good relationship with the state and federal foresters. Uh, we currently have about 28 employees in our company. We run six harvesters and five forwarders and 10 log trucks. The private landowner that we've been cutting on for a couple years now. Basically it's a hardwood thinning where we're at right here. There's some other areas on the property that we're doing some patch clear cuts. We came in and marked this a couple weeks ago with a good group, about 100 acres for this year and cut about 30 last year on the same, same piece. Marked it a little bit lower than we kind of normally would in a, in a conventional hardwood thinning because of some of these projects that we're doing here. We decided to do some of these canopy gaps in here so then when they come through for planting, they have the sunlight hitting the canopy floor to actually give some of those conifer species a chance to be able to flourish and kind of knowing that up front when we're marking we can identify those gaps up front and that helps the whole process as a whole and um, I think we were able to identify some areas in here that should work out really well and excited to see how the project goes once the planting actually happens. Uh, what, what usually happens is, is uh, a forester will go out and he'll, he'll mark the timber according to the prescription that they want it cut to. A little different in here, we're cutting, cutting it a little heavier because they're going to do that under planting. The trees will be marked and, the, and our guys will determine the best way to, to cut those marked trees to get them down and out efficiently to the landings where our trucks can haul them. A really important tool that we use while we're out here is, uh, is GIS and it's a computer program that we can create maps um, with, with different boundaries and uh, different areas and background layers. And so for this specific area, you can geo-reference a map that will go directly to your phone and you can open in a program called Avenza that all of our operators have and we made sure we had on the ground while we were, while we were marking. So you know exactly where you're at and you know exactly where the boundaries are. Typically we'll have either a flag line or a paint line, but sometimes you don't need that nowadays with, with Avenza and it, it's created a lot of efficiencies for us. And then now our guys in the machines are using it so they can see exactly where they are, what's been done, what needs to be done. And, and it helps us out as a company because then they can tell how many acres they have left and can say, okay, well on Wednesday, we'll be ready, we'll be ready to move. Whereas if they don't have that map, it's kind of a guessing game of how many acres they have left and how far along they are. So it's really, it's really been very beneficial for us to have that program and um, have those maps. Once we're done in here, the 
planting group will also have those maps so they'll know exactly where to go and exactly what needs to be done and it works out really well for for really everybody and it's checks and balances it's is huge we'll finish up this project next week with a look at planting that's all for tonight and i hope to see you right back here next week for upper michigan's very own discovering